Hey everybody, I hope y'all are doing well this evening, joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, if you've been watching our daily videos, you know this has kind of become one of my favorite outdoor spots to kind of hang out to do the videos. And I thought how appropriate to go ahead and do our Wednesday night Bible study this way as well. And just pre-recording instead of doing live because of the internet issues and storms that we've had rolling through lately, it's been a little bit difficult to get that done. But uh, tonight, look, we're going to be just looking at one verse in 1 Kings chapter uh, 18. Now, if you were at church this past Sunday for Sunday school, I know we went online for worship, but uh, during Sunday school, it's been going through the study on Elijah. And even as we talked about it last week, uh, some there as well. Uh, it was something just from the lesson and one verse in particular is really has just been uh, weighing on me and weighing on my heart a little bit. And that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. And uh, so let me open up our time with a word of prayer and then we'll jump right in there in First Kings. So let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, God, we just thank you and we praise you as always for your many, many blessings. And Lord, even though things happen all around us and uh, even with our families and things that in church family, friends, co-workers, uh, Lord, all these things that we don't quite understand, Lord, we know that you are still God on the throne. You are still in heaven, still ruling and reigning, and you will be for all of eternity. So, Lord, I just pray that tonight that, uh, that it, again, it would be your words, not mine. And, Lord, I pray that each and every person that would watch this and whenever they would uh, happen to watch it, Lord, that it would speak to them in the season of their life that they needed. And uh, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you. Ask you to bless this time in your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. So the thing is, as I was looking at 1 Kings chapter 18, and, and you may notice I don't have my normal like church clothes on, but I do have my, uh, you know, my super dad shirt on. It's got a whole bunch of handprints on it from my kids. And um, I'll get to why I actually chose this shirt this shirt for the video um, a little bit there at the closing of our, our time tonight. Um, but as we're looking here in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you remember all this going on with Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and, and I'm not going to go through the whole story. I, I encourage you, if you don't know the story, not familiar with it or weren't at Sunday school, that you read through uh, all of 1 Kings chapter 18 so you can see what's going on here. Uh, but essentially, in a nutshell, you have a competition, essentially, between God and Baal. And it's going to see who is the one true God. If you remember, Elijah, at the beginning of it, said, hey, you need to choose who you're going to follow. You're either going to follow Baal or you're going to follow God. And so when it all is said and done, God answers by fire. And even use that verse in our prayer focus on Sunday um, as Elijah was there praying uh, it's something here just in verse 39 when you finally see the people's response and they say this it says now when all the people saw it talking about uh, God answering by fire uh, and and just consuming the sacrifice and all the water that was in the trench it says now when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the Lord he is God. Now, just simply on that verse, and I just kept thinking and I kept asking this question, and this is kind of, uh, I'm going to give you a question and a point for the whole thing, and then we're going to look at four questions tonight. Uh, the, the overall kind of question that kept coming to me was, did he just become God just because they acknowledged it? Now, I think we would all answer that very easily and said, no, of course not. Of course, he was already God long before this. But see, the, I've kind of entitled this Bible study, Something Amazing. Something Amazing. And see, the point of all this is, is why do we wait until God shows us something spectacular to acknowledge that he's sovereign? Right, I mean, isn't that what the people were doing? They had, uh, the tribes had, had split up and there was all this Baal worship going on. They're following wicked uh, Jezebel and King Ahab and, and to think about what all's going on. And now Elijah here is telling them, look, you need to choose between God and Baal. And it wait, they have to wait. They can't even choose God. Then they wait to see how the competition is going to end. They're waiting to see this contest to see who's going to be, you know, victorious. 
And I just kept thinking in, in our lives, even today, yes, okay, maybe we don't see God answer by fire in a way uh, like they saw here. But if we're busy sitting around waiting for God to do something spectacular before we acknowledge that he is the God of all creation, before, he's the, before we acknowledge the fact that he is God who sent his son Jesus to die in our place on that old rugged cross. If we're waiting, and I could go on and on, if we're waiting for him to do something spectacular that everybody could see, then how much time have we wasted? And then are we truly seeking after him in a loving way? Or are we just seeking after him because we're scared of it? Now, I mean, I don't mean to say that there should be some, um, you know, some fear, some reverential fear, uh, knowing that we serve an almighty and powerful God. But how often are we just sitting around waiting for him to do something spectacular that we can see? before we begin to worship. And that's really kind of what the theme of tonight is, you know, as something amazing. But four questions that I wanted us to kind of look at. And the first is this, is he still God when we can't or cannot see him at work? Is he still God when we cannot see him at work? Let's look at Israel. How many times, just look back over their history, how many times had God already been working behind the scenes? I mean, just, just go back to the Exodus, right? When How much work was God doing behind the scenes that they didn't even see? Conversations with Moses that they didn't even know about. But God was working the whole time. So silently and, and kind of almost secretly, I mean, we don't know everything that's going on, right? We don't know everything that God is doing. He hears things we don't hear, sees things that we don't see. But is he still God when we can't see him at work? How many times did he guard Israel and protect them from their enemies? I mean, I mean, really, just look at them walking around the walls of Jericho. Did he not deliver? Was he not, was he not working even as they didn't know what was going on? He was just waiting for their obedience. Working silently. But through all of this, and you could go, I mean, we could go story after story looking in, in Old Testament history to see how Israel, all that God had done for his chosen people. But yet we see that even when they didn't see him at work, he still was working, but yet they had turned against him. You know, even what we see here with in the case of Elijah is the kingdom was divided. The kingdom was split up. Right. That was their response to an almighty God that, no, uh, we've been talking about through first Samuel. Then, no, we want a king. God, we want a king to to put everything back in order. Well, no, the king is what ended up bringing separation to divide them. But they end up being a a a group of people that are so bent on idol worship from the time they get rescued out of Egypt. They they get out of Egypt, but they never get Egypt out of Israel, right? Out of the people of Israel. All of that, I was thinking about even other uh, examples in Scripture of times where God is working silently and we don't see him. Uh, one we were just talking about this week that I love with 1 Samuel, uh, as they go to put the Ark of the Covenant in with uh, the false god Dagon, and then they come back the next morning and Dagon's laying on his face. The idol had fallen and worshipped. They do that two days in a row. The next day, he's really fallen into pieces. But I think about even in the New Testament, I think about when Peter, if you remember when he was in prison and the, uh, the people were praying for him, right? The church gathered and shut the door and were praying fervently for him. And Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, Peter is knocking on the door, ready to come in. And they're too afraid, right? The answer to their prayer is at the door, but they're too afraid to answer the door. And I think about that over and over again of how many times do we have a lack of faith like that because we don't see God working? I've used the example before that my buddy Jared had shared before, you know, talking about, uh, from scripture about leaning not on your own understanding. And he talks about even with his daughter and, and I won't go through the whole illustration, but uh, that he keeps telling her, you know, she was, she was small and she would jump off the counter and jump into his arms and and he would just go back a little bit further every time. And finally, one time he put his hands behind his back and she wouldn't jump. And and all it comes down to is she says, no, daddy, I want to see your hands. And and as as 
so many times with God when he's working silently behind the scenes that we don't see. We cry out to him and it's no, daddy, we want to see your hands. But if we're waiting, I'm going to go back to our theme. If we're waiting until he does something spectacular, waiting till it's something that we can see with our eyes, how much time have we wasted and how much time have we lost in, that we should have been spent? We basically, we spent it worrying instead of worshiping. And the second question is, is he still God when he does not answer our prayers? Is he still God when he doesn't answer our prayers? Now, I think, again, we would answer that and say, absolutely, he's still God. There's times where we're thankful for unanswered prayers. Those times where we ask for something and we look back later and thought, God, thank you for not answering that prayer request. God, I'm glad that your will was done in that situation. If you remember, right, the reason that Elijah was standing there, and I talked about Sunday a little bit about his prayer and the fact that he had called out to God in front of everybody so that they would know. Right? There was a... Do you think Elijah had a moment where he thought, God, uh, I really hope and pray you answer this time. If you remember, I don't, I don't believe there was a single moment where he didn't think that God was going to answer because God told him to do it. He was right in the middle of God's will and he knew that it wasn't, you know, maybe it was a little bit of Elijah's name on the line. But ultimately, this was not Elijah versus 450 prophets of Baal. No, this was God versus Baal. And he knew that God was going to prevail. But so if you remember the reason that he was doing the will of God, so maybe he didn't worry about his prayer not being answered. But the question is, is if you pray for something today and it doesn't uh, become answered the way that you thought it should, and not just today, but maybe it's something you've prayed about for a long time. You know, some people pray for the same thing for years upon years, maybe even their whole life, and it's never answered that way. Is he still God? Is he still worthy to be praised? Is he still worthy of our worship? See, too often the problem is we would try to jump ahead and do our own thing and then ask God to bless it. Now, how many times? Have, I, I won't even go into the times I've done that in my own life and just look back and think, man, that was, that was really dumb. And I'm sure that you've probably done something similar before. And we have to be careful as a church body not to do the same thing, that, that we don't go ahead of God, that we're waiting on him and then taking everything to him in prayer. And so why our focus this year has been on prayer and even every decision that we make, even like now, some the the decisions to, to, you know, to be quarantined are kind of taken out of our hands and looking out for everyone's safety. But even with that, everything is still, we've prayed about this before these situations ever come up. But even when God doesn't answer the way that we think, is he still God? You know, I was thinking about this, trying to think of different examples for each one of these. And, and the Lord just led me to this example of a prayer that wasn't answered. And I'd never thought about this. I heard this in a, in a sermon not too long ago, and I can't even remember who it was that was preaching it. But it was looking at the prayer of Jesus in the garden. Do you remember what he prayed? God, if there's any other way. And I had never thought about this before, but God's answer was no. God's answer was no, there is no other way. Does that mean that God ceased to be God at that moment? Absolutely not. Did it mean it was something wrong with the way that Jesus asked it? Absolutely not. But the will of God, the will of God the Father was that Jesus had to die on the cross. Jesus knew that he he was praying that the will of God would be done. But if there was any other way, let that be done. I wonder how many times we've been that close and, and that close to God and and feeling the spirit move in our prayer life so much to the point that that we were in dire need of God. If it's any other way. But not my will. But yours be done. See, even if he doesn't answer our prayers, he's still God. He's still worthy of our worship. 
Just like when we can't see him at work, he's still worthy of our worship. Same way when he doesn't answer our prayers. But that brings us to the third question. Is he still God when he does answer our prayers? Now, this one might be a little bit easier for you. You might say, well, absolutely. I mean, if he answered my prayer request, then obviously he heard me and he answered. So he must be God. But I think about this, you know, as we saw, uh, as we've gone through the book of Judges and now in 1 Samuel and our daily videos, if you've been following along in those. And, and even as we did some sermons on um, on Sundays on through some judges with Gideon and and things like that. One of the worst things, one of the worst judgments we ever see is God giving people exactly what they ask for. So is he still God when he allows us to suffer from our own consequences of our own actions and our own requests? Absolutely, he's still God. Absolutely, he's still God. I thought about this. What about those times in scripture where we see uh, basically, uh, for lack of a better way of saying, that we change the mind of God? Now you say, wait, it changed the mind of God. Well, yes, if we go to the Lord in prayer and, and there are times in scripture where things changed. I mean, you think about, I think about Joshua praying in, in the battle that the sun would stand still and it did, right? That wasn't that God would, had already planned to do that, but God heard his request and answered it according because it was according to his will that they would be victorious. They were having faith in him and he was... Uh, listening to and answering their request. But I thought about other times, I, th I thought about Jonah. You remember when Jonah was telling the people of Nineveh that, hey, you just wait a couple more days and judgment is coming. You're all going to be wiped out. Now that was true because that's what God told them. That's what God told Jonah to say. But Nineveh repented and God essentially changed his mind on what he was going to do. He delayed judgment, right? He, he put it off because they had repented and they had turned back to him. So is he still God when he changes his mind? Yes, because he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even the same as he says in 1 Samuel, I am the same. I change not. So even though it may seem on our end that he changes his mind, he doesn't. He's still doing his will. His will may change in situations that from our perspective, but on his perspective, I know, man, we could get really deep into this really quick. God's will is always to be done. So is he still God when he answers our prayers? Even when, you know, we pray for things that maybe we shouldn't, and he does finally give in and give us what we ask. Is he still God? Now, if we would say yes to all of these so far, yes, he's still God when I don't see him at work. Yes, he's still God when he doesn't answer my prayers. And yes, he's still God when he does. Uh, even through all that, are we worshiping him as we should? Are we still acknowledging that he is God of all creation as we should? But that brings us to the fourth one. Is he still God? when we are outnumbered is he still god when we are outnumbered and i think maybe today this day in time right now christians feel more outnumbered than likely ever before i mean at least i guess i can say at least in my lifetime i know in my lifetime it seems that christians are more outnumbered and i'm sure you get throughout the course of history and that wouldn't really maybe wouldn't be the case in all areas but at least here in America, that right now, it seems as though Christians are becoming outnumbered. Elijah felt all alone. One versus 450. And that, that's just the prophets of Baal. They wasn't even including the whole nation that had turned against God. He felt all alone. Now, he would find out later that he was not all alone. That there were plenty more still around that had not bowed to Baal. But at that moment, while he was on Mount Carmel, he felt all alone, except he still had God. And he knew that was all that he ever needed. Now, think about this. If you have to stand all alone, is he still God? 
Now, I don't want you to just answer that and say, absolutely. I, I want you to really think about that because there's coming a time when we're going to have to stand virtually alone. There's coming a time when when our we're going to see our freedoms just continue to erode away. I mean, this is what Revelation talks about. We know what's coming in the end. Right. So why would we ever think that everything would not be speeding up to get us to that point? Now, I still believe that the church will be raptured up before the tribulation time. But we know that things are going to get uh, increasingly worse and worse. But see, it's always been that way. You say, what? That's Elijah by himself. How many times do we see prophets standing alone preaching the word of God? How many times in the New Testament do we see the, um, the disciples and the apostles, you know, standing, essentially standing alone for God? So the question is, if you have to stand alone, will you still recognize that he is God of all creation? And I'm not talking about taking a stand for your personal views or your, uh, you know, your political stance or anything like that. Oh, yeah, people get up on that soapbox in a minute. No, I'm talking about standing on the word of God, standing on his truth, standing on the gospel message. That God's truth is the only truth. If you have to stand there all alone, will you still stand and will you still acknowledge that God is still a good God, that he's still a God worthy of being worshipped and praised. Kept thinking about like Daniel in the lion's den, how he was not afraid to be the only one who was still praying, even when praying was outlawed. Same for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they were not going to worship even if everybody else was. And even though they were miles from home and nobody would ever know, but they still stood and even boldly stood and said, look, it doesn't matter what you say. Look, we would rather obey God. Because we know that God can rescue us, right? Even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to you, O King. Got to think about even in the New Testament, how many times the apostles, you know, that they come out rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. I read something just this evening was talking about people all around the world were dying for Jesus but people in America would quit believing in Jesus simply because their feelings got hurt. Hmm. While others around the world are willing to die for their belief in Jesus, Americans would quit believing just because their feelings got hurt. It's a sad state that we live in. But even with all of this, then even to think about just Hebrews 11, man, you just go to all those great um, those great ones in the Old Testament, just same time, ordinary people that God did extraordinary works through their faith. That even though there were horrendous things that happened to them, to many of them, that still by faith, they were victorious because God was still God of all creation. Kind of brings me to this kind of closing thought. And I thought about it, as all this is going on, God answers loudly by fire, right? I mean, they've been waiting all this time. There'd been a whole lot of commotion going on all day long, waiting to see whether or not Baal was going to answer or see if God was going to answer. And we see God answer by fire. And, and you can imagine what a, I can only imagine what kind of sight and sound that would have been to be there on Mount Carmel that night, that day. To see that and to hear it and to just to witness the pure miracle of God that it was, the hand of God at work right in front of them. And that's why they fell on their faces, right? They fell on their faces and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. But when God answered loudly, they responded loudly. Right. Yeah. And there's plenty of times we do that ourselves. Man, when God does something great and miraculous, man, we get loud and we get excited about it. But what about the times that God answers silently? Or even just quietly? When he answers quietly, how do we respond? You say, well, I respond quietly. Yeah, but I think too often when sometimes when God responds really quietly, we don't respond at all. We kind of keep it to ourselves. 
Isn't the God who gave us those little small victories the same God uh, who deserves the same worship over a small victory as he does the big, large fireball victories? Isn't our, our worship and our acknowledgement of God just as important when he answers the everyday needs that we have as it is for the super huge moments in our lives? And that really just brings me back to, you know, now this is funny. I don't know if many of you have seen the Incredibles movie. Pixar's movie, you know, this family of superheroes. And I just kept thinking about it, right beside, there's this little kid that lives beside the Incredibles family. And he's always, you know, kind of seeing Mr. Incredible do some kind of funny things. And um, there's this one time where, Mr. Incredible comes home. He gets out of the car. The little kid is sitting there on his tricycle, as he always is on the sidewalk. And he says, what do you want? And the little boy, says, or he says, what are you waiting for? And the little boy says, I don't know, something amazing, I guess. I could not help but shake that feeling when I was reading this passage to think how these people must have been sitting there and how often we sit there today just waiting on, I don't know, I guess I'm waiting on God to do something amazing. But then that brought me even back to why I put on this shirt for this Bible study. Right, I mean, my kids gave this to me for Father's Day. I got several different shirts from the kids, but this one, um, it's got my little super dad on there and got all the handprints. And I just thought about, you know, how often that our kids and even as a kid myself that I would look to, to my dad. And I mean, both my parents and grandparents all the same, but that we would look to them as though they were super, Right. And that my kids might think that I'm super dad, even when I just do ordinary dad things. Yeah, it's plenty of times I do ridiculous dad things. Tell really bad dad jokes, of course. But they may think I'm super dad just for being their dad. Isn't that the same way that we should treat our heavenly dad? He, he, he is our super dad. He's our heavenly father who loved us so much he sent his son to die in our place. Let's, let's quit wasting time sitting around waiting for him to do something amazing because he already has. If he never did anything for us ever again, he's still worthy of our worship for all eternity. So I guess the point of all this tonight has just been, I pray this would be an encouragement that we would quit wasting time waiting on something amazing and just simply worship an amazing God. He's worthy of our praise when he's working silently. He's worthy of our worship when he answers our prayers and even when he doesn't. And even if we have to stand all alone and it seems like the whole world has abandoned us, he will always be there and he will always be God. Now that's something and that's someone worth worshiping. And I'm going to tell you, well, you don't have to wait for anything else amazing because we already serve an amazing God. God bless you all. And I pray you have a great, great night.